Okay, uh, so welcome everyone to the Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, April 8th. We are reconvening the meeting after uh, a recess. Uh, we had an in-camera session earlier this, this afternoon. Um, so we'll reconvene now and I will ask for any items added to the agenda. There is one item, uh, Earth Day Municipal Supports. Uh, I'd like to add as item number 14A. Um, are there any other items to add? Okay, could I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Can I have a seconder, please? I'll second. Thanks, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion on the agenda? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. Okay, the next item is the review of the minutes from March 11th, 2024. If there's no error or omissions, could I have a mover and a seconder on the approval of the minutes, please? I'll move to approve the minutes. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. Um, I should have mentioned from the outset too, we do have regrets from Councillor uh, Michael Digden. He is um, away this week and wasn't able to join us. Um, all right, so I guess we're gonna move into the next part of our agenda, which are the presentations. And we'll start with a presentation, I believe, from Timothy Webster from Nova Scotia Community College regarding our changing coastlines. And Timothy is joining us virtually. Hi, Tim. Hello. How you doing this evening? Pretty good, pretty good. You've got a couple folks. From the, from the, from the, <laughs> the eclipse just did you one over, did it? Oh no. <laughs> um, so Tim, welcome to Richmond County Council. You've got a couple of NSCC folks in the in your council table crowd tonight. Both uh, myself and uh, Melanie Councillor Melanie Sampson both work at the Strait Area Campus. So great to see you. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, we also have the Deputy Warden, Sean Sampson, with us this evening, as well as Councillor Brent Sampson. Um, your name does not have to be Sampson in order to sit around this table. I'd just like to make that clear. It was a happy accident. <laughs> um, and we have a crowd full as well in the gallery and some staff with us this evening. So we'll hand things over to you, I guess, if, we're, if you're ready, and uh, you can take it away. Sure, so I understand you were going to play the slideshow, and I... Is that what's going to happen? Do want to share my screen? You can share your screen if you like. Oh, very good. Perfect. Uh, da, da, da. Just bear with me two second here. No worries. We're kind of an MS Teams crowd at the college. The, <laughs> the Zoom can be challenging for us. <laughs> it's challenging yeah, it's, for me anyway. <laughs> it's always tricky to find the right window. And I'm always a fellow with too many darn windows. Open, so. <laughs> All right, let's see if this... Uh, well, we'll, we'll let you know if we're looking at your email or whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Uh, well, let's... Uh, Share this one and see what we get here. There we go. That looks like it. We see, I think we oh. see a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, okay, very good. Is it in, uh, it's probably not in, there. There it, it is. is. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I've got quite a few slides here, so I will uh, <laughs> I'll move through these fairly rapidly. So. I thought what I would do today is talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the challenges with our coastline. And, uh, you know, you folks, uh, Fiona, went right overhead. I, I know it, I don't believe it caused a tremendous amount of damage in Richmond County, but uh, obviously the rest of Cape Breton and the Northumberland Strait, a uh, tremendous amount of, uh, of damage there. Sea level rise and climate change is coming. Um, 
And I'll show you an example of Cape John and specifically with some impacts of Fiona. And I want to end things off with uh, uh, a research Nova Scotia proposal that I'm putting forward that uh, uh, hopefully will be a, you'll see some benefit as being the county, um, especially in lieu of the province getting rid of the Coastal Protection Act. And, uh, you know, perhaps uh, you'll see fit to, to support this project. Okay, agents of coastal change. Really, it's, it's associated with storm events where we have both elevated water levels and wave action are typically the, uh, the two factors that come together to really cause significant erosion. Um, there are other things as well. Uh, the absence of sea ice, for example, local wind direction, how exposed you are, how much fetch. So in other words, how much open water there is to, for waves to build up. Uh, and other factors, but really it, it's during major storm events. Now, uh, here is a, a shot of the Northumberland Strait after a storm, and uh, just keep your eye on the fence post there, and here is what the same area looked like in the spring. So you can see a lot of that area has slumped, and if we go back um, what tends to happen is if we get these storms in the winter, either hurricanes or nor'easters, uh, the bank gets cut near vertical, but is either frozen or somewhat stabilized by the, by the, the cold temperature. And then come spring, everything slumps. And to the average landowner, if they're a cottager, um, they'd come back and maybe wouldn't even notice that there was a significant change in the bank. It would look almost the same. Those fence posts really provide us a, a good uh, measuring stick to see how much slump has occurred there. Now, how do we go about measuring um, coastal change? We can use you know, survey equipment on the far left and, and take point measurements. Uh, we can use laser scanning, especially if we have a, a vertical surface we're trying to measure um, where we can't just go along and, and walk down over the bank. Uh, we have more sophisticated material in terms of mobile mapping where we can drive along the coast or put it in a boat and scan the bank. Now drones are becoming very uh, efficient and the precision of measurement is, is now getting to the point we can use those quite effectively. And, and of course, we've relied historically on aerial photographs and now more recently, topo, topographic LIDAR and this thing called topobathymetric LIDAR, I'll explain in a minute. And satellite imagery is becoming high enough resolution we can actually measure change fairly well in that regard. So on the left-hand side, is a shows you kind of the concept of how we've measured erosion in the past. Typically, you can imagine we've taken a historical aerial photograph. We, we digitize where the coastline is at time one. We then have a later photograph at time two. And then we can look at and measure the distance between the coastline and these two time periods. We then, once we know the distance and we know the time period separating the photos, we then can come up with a rate. So oftentimes we're using photos that are decadal in scale and we get a rate maybe typically of say 30 centimeters a year. And this, this might give people a false sense that erosion is a continuous process at about a foot per year. But of course it's not. It's more of an episodic event for when we have big surges and we may go years without very significant erosion at all. On the right hand side sort of takes you to the modern age where we're using what are called digital elevation models. So my apology for the, uh, the jargon here, but uh, a digital elevation model, this is collected from a drone at time one. And then after a storm, we can go out and survey again, and it may not be obvious what's changed, but there's the elevation after the storm. And then we can do this technique called difference of DEMs, DOD, and we actually can subtract the two. And what this allows us is to not only look at how much the coast has retreated back, but actually gives us a volumetric measurement of how much sediment has been removed. So this is much more informative and uh, and can give us much more detail of the impacts of a, of a given storm event. Here's an, an example prior to Fiona of, uh, of this particular area. We see some armoring and we have a community pasture here and, and no protection on this shoreline. And there's the day after Fiona. And uh, you may not have really been able to tell the amount of erosion too easily, but we can see that some 
significant erosion has happened behind the armor stone. There's been some flooding and inundation. And then here's the same shot a few days uh, later, a little brighter conditions. And we can see the debris line and so forth. This is all of the uh, material thrown up by the ocean. Uh, and that, that salt water is, is sort of slowly draining away. So if we look at the left-hand side, this would be kind of the older method of doing it, where we have two photos of different time periods. The coastline is in yellow here. We're, we're defining that as the top of the bank. And then on the bottom photo, the white line is after Fiona. So uh, there are areas where the coast has, the shoreline has moved back fairly significantly, other areas not so much. Now, if we look at the right hand side, this is a, a three dimensional view because all of these data are collected in 3D now. And I've just digitized the, the top of the bank and the toe of the slope. And when we now look at the before and after, uh, we can see how much material has been chewed away, especially at the toe of the slope. And of course, that slope is going to probably slump over time uh, as the bank tries to go back to reach equilibrium. So these are kind of the differences in how we go about measuring, measuring erosion. Now, what causes this? Well, storm surge is a, a major culprit. And, and we used to say that January 2000 was one of the largest storm surges on record in this region. Fiona has now uh, set the new record. And a storm surge occurs when we get a low air pressure or barometric pressure and wind tends to push the water level towards the shore. When you hear the weather uh, forecasters talk about a deep low and for every one millibar of barometric pressure drop, the ocean raises one centimeter. When it's, ra when it's able to raise in one place, it's lowering in other places. And that actually contributes to the storm surge as well as the wind. Of course, if this surge happens at high tide, this is when we typically will have our flooding and erosion. Now, increased relative sea level rise is going to make this problem worse in the future. And relative sea level rise is a combination of global sea level rise, and this is what we often hear from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for example, when they come out with their new AR6 report and things like this. It's a combination of global sea level rise and local crustal dynamics. And unfortunately, this part of the Maritimes is sinking after the last glaciation. So when we look at the existing tide gauges in the region, it's very common for us to see that relative sea level rise has been raising by about 32 centimeters a century, so about a foot a century. And when we look to the future, uh, global sea level rise, we have ranges from 50 to 250 uh, centimeters, uh, depending on, you know, how we're going to move forward with our carbon, em carbon emissions. And, and the Maritimes, this part of the Maritimes is typically sinking at about 15 centimeters a century. So not too many scientists question using a number like expect to see one meter of relative sea level rise in the next hundred years. And we have just a couple of graphics here. This shows the, uh, the annual mean water level from Charlottetown. And you can see that's a pretty steady uh, increase here. Uh, and this was up till 1995. And there's our 32 centimeters a century. It's the slope of the line. And on the left, these isobars here basically represent all of the blue areas are representing where the crust is subsiding. Uh, in other words, sinking compared to uh, the, the blue, the orange areas where things are being slightly uplifted. So unfortunately, we have a, a double edged sword. And if we if we look at that on a broader scale, um, this graph here shows us these red areas are essentially showing us um, where relative sea level rise is increasing and the green bars are showing us where the crust is sinking. So you'll notice in the Maritimes and most of Atlantic Canada, um, relative sea level rise is going up and, and different green bars are all heading down at different rates. Compare that to the St. Lawrence, which is kind of the opposite condition. So they'll have a problem in the long term with perhaps shipping and navigation uh, in the St. Lawrence Seaway. And right now, the area that's uplifting the most is uh, over uh, uh, Hudson Bay, where the ice sheet was the thickest. 
And of course, when we look to the future, we saw a linear trend of relative sea level rise. But the big question is, with more CO2 emissions, are we going to start seeing an acceleration of global sea level rise? And here, we've, they've, they make use of these things called uh, representative concentration pathways. And the one that we're typically using is RCP 8.5, which is business as usual, in that we are not curbing our um, uh, carbon output emissions uh, sufficiently. And there you can see the margin of error goes between about one centimeter down to about a half meter, uh, coming in around about the 70 centimeter mark for global sea level rise. Now remember, we need to also account for the fact that the crust is think sinking here as well. Let's talk a little more about erosion, and this is uh, in, along the Northumberland Strait using a whole bunch of historical aerial photos going all the way back to 1936. And, and you can see Tim, all these. Tim, could I, for, could I interrupt for one second? I just wanted to give you a little time check. We've got about four or five minutes left, okay? Okay. okay. All, yeah. right. all right. I'm going to go through this pretty quick and jump to this next one okay. that basically says, you know, hey, if we take the 36 and the 2014, on average, we're eroding at 25 centimeters a century in terms of retreating back. And that's a very common number. Now, in the elevation world, we can look at the, what the coastline looked like in 2022 versus back in 2006. And there's our 30 centimeters again. In some places next to armoring, we actually see maybe an increase. And if we step that back, there's our horizontal shift, but as well, we can look at the volumetric shift. And I'll go through Fiona here pretty quickly. We've developed this tool called an emergency flood risk management system, where we get a prediction from Environment Canada 10 days out. And this blue line represents the predicted storm surge. And this was a few days before Fiona. We marry that or we merge it with the predicted tide, which is here in orange and we get a total water level. In this case, the surge was predicted to be two meters. So we knew that was going to be an extremely high surge. So Port Hood was predicted to have a total water level of 1.8, Picto 2.1. These yellow numbers here are where we've actually gone out and surveyed the high water mark. And what that accounts for is actually wave run up as well. And a few shots very quickly showing what normally it looked like at Cape John and what it looked like during the storm. Uh, some cottages here and how they were moved off their foundation. Um, now, when we could predict this, we have this seamless elevation model. We have a technology called this topobathymetric LIDAR. So all of this water, is, all of this is elevation surveyed under the water using the laser. And what we can do is project and estimate where the flood could go. So for example, we said the total water level was going to be 2.1, and if we add 0.8 meters on for waves, this is the area we think was going to be flooded, 2.9. And when we look and compare, hey, it's very close. There's the debris line with our 2.9 water level, so we know we had a boat. Waves were almost a meter high, and we were able to measure that water level as well. Um, we actually had a 2.4 meter storm surge. This is the predicted in orange, the observed in blue, and here is the actual surge. You may note when, they, when the province canceled the Coastal Protection Act, they came out with this worst case, this flood mapping tool. And there's the same area, and this says, this is the worst case flooding expected in 2100. Well, that worst case flooding is only 20 centimeters higher than what Fiona reached. Now, the reason that is the case is because they're using, and we're using as scientists, outdated and underrepresentative storm surge return periods. So in other words, what is the 100-year storm surge? We're using numbers that I don't think are as representative as they could be. So this new proposal I'm putting forward, we're really focusing in on the climate change aspect. It's broken down into four pillars. This is a little different than the PDF I sent you that, that expands on it. But we want to do work on coastal flooding to expand the hurricane warning system. We want to do work on river flooding so that we can actually predict 
with, with weather forecast. We want to do erosion mapping throughout the province to give municipalities the ability to generate bylaws and do land use planning that would then help them avoid putting people at infrastructure at risk. And lastly, we want to uh, help develop a, a more robust fire uh, prediction system. So uh, I'll conclude by saying that, you know, we are vulnerable as coastal communities are vulnerable now to storm surge flooding and erosion. This is only going to get worse with, uh, with sea level rise and climate change. Um, the jury is still out about are our storms more intense and more frequent. There's no question Fiona was a very intense storm. The waters were warmer farther to the north, so we may expect uh, more intense storms moving forward. Uh, I won't go through the rest of these, but uh, this new proposal is called Geo Solutions for Climate Change Hazards. And uh, we really see the municipalities as being one of the end users of this information. And uh, perhaps I'll follow up and, uh, and uh, send a one pager about that so you folks can share that around the council. And, and uh, hopefully you'll be supportive of this proposal as it uh, moves forward through to Research Nova Scotia. So, so with that, with that I'll, uh, I'll, stop I'll stop and uh, thank you. And if, if there's time for questions, I'd be more than happy to try to entertain those. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, it's, you know, it's hard not to feel completely overwhelmed when you're looking at the information and the challenge ahead of us, but um, really appreciate your focus in on how municipalities could use this information to protect infrastructure and people, frankly, you know, yes, um, yes. we're, you know, these are our main concerns and we watched Hurricane Fiona barreling down at us and lucked out, I guess, because we were in the eye of the storm so long that we didn't have the level of damage that other places did. So, um, you know, but that's not what the prediction was coming, you know, was looking like when we were watching it come towards us. Um, I, you know, definitely be very interested in seeing your, your proposal. Um, we've been having some chats about climate plan, you know, updates. We haven't touched our climate plan since 2013. Um, it's a long time and it's something that we've, this council has discussed, how can we resource that? We've talked about how, you know, what are some opportunities for us to, um, you know, to change our bylaws now. We, you know, we recently passed some land use bylaws and, and municipal planning strategy referring to the Coastal Protection Act, anticipating its <laughs> passage in the legislature and of course that didn't happen, so we've got some work to do there. Um, I guess, you know, I will also comment that certainly your observation on the, 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 the mapping tool that the province has provided is similar to ours. It's, you know, maybe a little bit conservative in its estimates and, and that concerns us greatly as well. But as you say, we, you know, they're like us, only can use the best data they have available and so that's the, the situation we're in. So your project is timely and, and frankly, um, probably, you know, well, I would consider critically important. Um, but I will ask uh, uh, councillors, I know we're a little pressed for time. Do, does anybody have any questions for Tim at this time? No, you blew everyone's minds. They're speechless. <laughs> they have not If anybody <laughs> does think of something, uh, I've been corresponding with Shelley. I'd, I'd be happy to answer anything through email and so forth. So Great. thank you again for your time yeah. and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And they have left, and uh, so, um, and I think Tim, you mentioned that you had updated the PDF. Um, so if you could send yes, that along yes. for sure, that'd be great. Absolutely, Absolutely I, will. Yeah, I will. Awesome. Yeah, and please reach out to us. We'll be we'll be at the ready to support that proposal. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Have a good evening. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Well, that's a tough act to follow, but <laughs> Sergeant Brad <laughs> Kelly is with us from the RCMP <laughs> here in Richmond County. So, Sergeant, welcome. <laughs> I don't even know if I know what to say right now, so that's, uh, that's you know, par for the course when you hear from uh, Mr. Webster. So, um, so over to you, I guess, uh, Brad, and yeah, yep, press the red button to talk. Okay. Does that come through here? Clayton? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So technical difficulties, we'll just get that whipped up. It's funny how the virtual went so smoothly and now here we are. <laughs> it's just switching back and forth between the two. So anyway. New system and old system working together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right.
Okay, we've got it. I hesitate to say, could we zoom in a little bit? There's a lot of words on that screen. Yeah, and you know, we don't, um, You'll just press, just if you want to press the red button, Brad, thank you. Good. Hello, everybody. Uh, before we begin, my name is Brad Kelly. I am the, uh, the sergeant, the district commander for the Richmond County RCMP. I've been here about eight, nine months now. I came down from uh, Bedeck and Wamacook from Victoria County. Um, I have a presentation for you today. I wasn't sure what to present you, but I thought that we would go over, since my first time here, some of the stats that we, that we collect uh, as the RCMP over the past four years, just to show you maybe some of the crime trends and the things that we've noticed uh, that has been going on in Richmond County. Um, the first page is just explaining what some of the, some of the terms are. Um, occurrences are just data and total generated from the PROS files. PROS is the program that we use to capture all of our statistics. Um, there's uh, unfounded occurrences, which we determined didn't happen, but I'll explain them as we go. Can you, can you click on that little expander? There you go. Better? Okay. Okay, we'll start here. Um, so we've been tracking the stats since 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year, all the way up until uh, this January of 2024. Uh, so on the right-hand side here with the bar graph um, is the January occurrences uh, for 2020 up until 2024. So if you're following with me, um, in January of 2020, we had 220 five calls for service. 2021 was 175 calls for service. And then uh, up until this year, there was 160 so far up in, when this report was made, January 31st. Um, in the circle graph below it, you'll see the different types of calls. So the bulk of our complaints are traffic violations. That's 40% of our calls in Richmond County. So that will include anything from uh, impaired driving, uh, somebody reporting, somebody drunk driving, dangerous driving, speeding, um, basically any type of traffic violation that you can think of, that will get captured there. Um, the next 28% uh, is we call, it's a info, assist files. Um, that can be anything from can you go and check on my elderly neighbor? Neighbor, It's been a storm and nobody's heard from them in three days. And it could be stuff like that. Um, next would be 14% would be property crimes. Um, mischief, damage to homes, damage to property, to vehicles, um, and that sort of thing. 7% would be crimes against persons, which would be your assaults, uh, domestic assaults, um, any type of violence against somebody. Uh, but that's the bulk of our calls. That's what we're seeing. Uh, that's fairly consistent for every month of the year as well. They change a little bit, but that's pretty much it. Uh, down the bottom left corner here, you'll just see the stats for the, uh, for the past few months of the, each year. Go on to the next one here. So if you're looking in the top left, uh, you'll see how many calls for each type of uh, crime that we had for that year. So the, the significant ones are the traffic violations. For 2024, we had almost 1,400 calls for traffic plaints, uh, 230 calls for property crime, um, 149 calls for service for crimes against persons. So that's kind of the trend that we're seeing. So in 2023 to 2024, we had 25, approximately 2,500 calls for service. Um, it's been fairly consistent over the past four years. Not a lot of change there. But that's where we're at as the Richmond County RCMP. Um, so in saying that, right now we're developing our, our plans and our strategies for the upcoming fiscal year, which just started for us a few days ago. So the things that we want to focus on are, is more traffic enforcement. That will include the main highways, Arishat, all through Chapel Island as well, where we're noticing the big, the big problems. Um, 
that would probably be our number one priority for this year. Um, I'm, up to, I'm open to your suggestions to see where else you like to direct us or you'd like to see us work towards. That's kind of what we feel is the big thing. Um, another thing here that is not really captured well, but I think is on the rise, is frauds. We are seeing a lot of fraud reports, uh, a lot from elderly people. Um, I think this year, I think it says in that property crimes on the right there, I think we had 58 for 2023, 2024. I would not be surprised if that's up to 70 or 80 this year. Oh I feel that we're getting a lot of fraud complaints and significant fraud complaints. Uh, multiple thousands of dollars people are being frauded. Uh, it could be anything from minor things. People are buying things off Facebook Marketplace. Mm -hmm. They're sending money before receiving it. Um, that's been an issue. Um, we're seeing young people be extorted. Um, also a type of, a type of fraud, there's, you know, there's, they're saying something they shouldn't send, then somebody that they're talking to online is extorting them for money, frauding them for money. Um, so that's also on the rise that we've noticed as well. Um, I think we should, we would like to address as well. Uh, a lot with the elderly population, seniors, they seem to be a little bit more um, trusting, I would think, maybe is the word, and they're, uh, yeah, sending money to people they don't know and then not getting it back. Um, another one we're seeing is people are looking for places to rent to live. They'll see an ad online. They'll respond to it and they'll say, you can have this apartment. It's yours. Just send me a th $1,000 deposit. They send this deposit and then they, the ad gets taken off and their place to live is gone. Such another one we're seeing a lot of as well. Uh, but that's where I feel that we're going in this year. I'm open to suggestions to see what you guys think, to see what you'd like to see the RSCP focus on as well. So I'll leave it to you guys. Well, thanks. I'm sure there's some questions about this graph here. Yeah, th thanks, Sergeant. Um, I, I guess the immediate question that comes to my mind is, do you, are you engaged with, like, you mentioned young people, or do you guys have a presence in the schools where you're doing that kind of education with students? Or? Do. Uh, it could be better. Each officer is assigned to a school, mm -hmm. um, and we, they go in and do talks to the school. Um, that's something we could work on even more. Doing, uh, I have a meeting with Schools Plus tomorrow. Great. Um, I'm meeting with them tomorrow to go over uh, more of some drug issues that they're seeing. Yeah. But that's something I can bring up with them as well. Um, yeah. And then the seniors. We have connected with a few of the seniors' complexes. The Seniors Take Action Coalition is very active in this county. Uh, that would be a great group to connect with. And we now, yeah, we now have the um, Center of Rural Aging and Health. Um, it's run at a, as a straight area campus, but would be a, you know, a great resource potentially. So the Senior Safety Coordinator, that's right, Rachel LeBlanc, uh, at the, she's based out of the Kingston Health Center, um, would be a great uh, connection there as well. It's, you know, it's disturbing when you, it's, you know, and, and the housing, you know, advertising an apartment and then sending the money. People are desperate for housing right now, and it's, uh, it's a recipe for disaster, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Other than that, um, staffing-wise, level-wise, we're 100% staffed right now. Oh, wow. Um, we are full. Oh, we'll just get you to press your button. As for uh, staffing levels, we're 100% staffed right now. Uh, the final officer arrived last week. Uh, the new supervisor for Arishat. Um, he just came down from Inverness. So we're at 100%. I can't say that happens too often. So it's... Uh, <laughs> we're in a sweet spot. <laughs> I, I don't want to jinx it. Um, so it's, 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 it's really good for us. It's huge. Yeah, it doesn't uh, usually ebbs and flows. People come and go. But right now, it's everyone's here. Mm -hmm. So we're good that way. Yeah. Does anybody, does anybody have any other questions for Sergeant uh, Kelly? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so as you're talking about uh, the rise in these fraud cases, I mean, how many of these are actually resulting in any kind of action? Like, is it a lot of reports, but at the end of the day, people are not, you know, that people are not being charged with those crimes? Yes, you're right. A lot of the times, a lot of these result in reports to us, and then they, um, uh, it just stops there. Um, 
multiple, re if it, the fraud is very low, if it's a few hundred dollars, to try and track down some of the people that are committing these frauds is extremely difficult. It takes tons of manpower and hours to get there. And a lot of times they're happening from individuals overseas. Um, so even if we spend 50 hours of manpower trying to track it down to see where it went, mm -hmm. we get to the point that it's happened in Nigeria, mm -hmm. and then you're stuck. We, there's nothing, uh, mm -hmm. we're stuck there. Um, there was one recent we tracked to Montreal. Uh, it was about a $10,000 one. So that was good. That, that one stayed in the country, which makes it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Still not easy, but uh, most of them are overseas. <coughs> yeah. So a lot of them fall... They get reported and then they, they stop there. Okay, thanks. I mean, it's education, right? E education, education. It continues to be. I think we all have to. We all have to be part of the defense system against it, right? So, yeah, yeah. It was just thinking too. Sometimes, if there's some of these things specifically that um, that you folks are aware of or are concerned by and that maybe could reach out to the staff at the county to post these things like on the mm -hmm. county Facebook mm -hmm. page and so on and that just because there is a, a, a lot of people that check that stuff and to get more traction with it. No, I like that. There's been, maybe I'll come up with, there's been three or four kind of common ones that we've been seeing. Um, maybe I can get them to you so we can post them up there so people can read them and if they're met with the same situation, it might click in their head that something seems off about this and they don't go down that same path yeah I think that kind of a, almost like a case study you know you you give an example this is you know if you see this you know don't send the money first kind of thing Th those types of examples I think will help people kind of you know be more aware so okay any other questions for uh, for the sergeant no. Awesome. Thank you for putting this data together. It's really well done. And, um, you, you know, if we look through it and have more questions, we'll reach out to you for sure. Thank you. All right. Um, so that takes care of our presentations uh, section of the agenda. We're going to move into new business. And um, the first item is the presentation of Heritage Plaques which is very exciting. I have the lovely plaques here next to me. Um, so we'll begin with the presentation of plaques for the St. John's Anglican Church, Friends of St. John's Airshat Society. I think Marg Herdman and Jason Langdon are here with us this evening. Have I captured your group? Well, we also have Cameron. Oh, Cameron, okay. Yeah. Perfect, awesome. Well, thank you to the folks from the St. John's uh, Anglican Church. And um, we're gonna come up and get a picture here. So we'll, if you want to come up, we can present you with your plaque. Deputy Warden, did you want to join me, since these are folks from your region? <laughs> you can come right on up here, in front of these lovely flags. How's that? And my glasses, and I didn't really prepare for picture taking here very well. Anyway. <laughs> Okay. Slide in, yeah, come on in. Slide in. Oh, there we go. Don't knock the flag. Just a little bit. All right, come on this way. Does it sound good? Yeah. Come on. I don't bite. No, I know. Well, just get up. So here, I'm going to hand that to you. So when you want to take it, and look at that black. You've got to be careful. Yeah, it's heavy. You guys pull up here, and then I'm going to take a close-up of the black, please. Okay. Got her. Awesome. So well done. Thanks for all your input to this you. facility. It's amazing. Yeah. And thank, thank you for you your input too, because I know yes. you have something to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks so a lot. Thank, thank you. you. You can take that flag with you, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then the next uh, the next group are the folks from the St. Patrick's Church, the St. Patrick's Church Preservation Society, which I believe would be thank you, Chris. Uh, Whiteside? So, Mel Councillor Melanie, if you'd like to come on up. All right. You must be Brenda. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come on this side of you, Brenda. <laughs> so, here you go. Congratulations wow. on your designation and the plaque. And <laughs> good, I got a bunch. All right, very good. Close so up. Yes. Awesome. 
It's Thank heavy you. as lead. It is. <laughs> can, can I just say a few words? You sure can. Yeah. yeah. I'll just get my paper. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm not sure which yeah, one of these was mine. mine. Maybe this one? Okay. <laughs> So Brenda just wanted to say a few words. So Brenda, if you just want to press the button there you, you, in oh. front of Mike's, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Baseball here. There you go. <laughs> uh, Warden Amanda uh, Marbaquet. Uh, Deputy Warden uh, Sean Sampson, Council Members, uh, and Municipal Clerk uh, Shelley David. On behalf of the community and the Whiteside Church Preservation Society and our President uh, Karen Walker, I would like to extend a sincere and heartfelt thank you for presenting us with this heritage plaque which recognizes the historic significance of St. Patrick's Church. Our society raises funds to protect preserve, and maintain St. Patrick's Church at Whiteside on behalf of our ancestors who built it through hard work and sacrifice, and on behalf of those buried in the adjacent cemetery. This plaque reinforces and recognizes the church as a spiritual and historical symbol of our history and identity. With honor and respect, we proudly acknowledge St. Patrick's Church sits on the traditional Mi'kmaq ancestral lands. Thank you again for all your efforts, and this plaque is a tangible reminder of the church's importance. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Much appreciated. And I should also offer, Marg, or if any of your group would like to say a few words. I know that was very <laughs> spontaneous, but it's entirely up to yourself. I asked if you say OK. No. <laughs> there was a bit of a surprise to us this evening, so. <laughs> Certainly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you very much, folks. And thanks to the, all the volunteers who are putting tireless hours into those two heritage properties. It's, uh, it's, an important, it's important work you do, so much appreciated. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to the agenda now, um, and uh, I would before we actually do move on from that, I would definitely recommend you pass those plaques around the room, make sure everybody knows how heavy they are. <laughs> That's some heavy plaque stuff going on there, so. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, the next item, which is the review of the Warden's Council report. So I did provide that in advance. Does anybody have any questions on it? Okay, so hearing none, um, next is the item regarding the municipal growth framework. So uh, just to give some context on this, I did receive uh, an email from uh, Councillor Fraser Patterson up in Victoria County. I believe he is involved in some discussions at the national level uh, with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities regarding um, work that the FCM uh, is doing on a municipal growth framework. And he had requested that we pop this onto our agenda. I've included a backgrounder. There was, I think, a website link as well where you could get more information, and um, as well as a draft resolution. Um, the reality is uh, that about 95% of our municipal revenue comes from property tax dollars. So we don't have a great diversity of revenue. Uh, only about 5% comes from own source or other sources of, of funding. So, um, you know, the, the, and we're not alone. That is typical for many, especially rural municipalities across the country. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the statistic that the FCM shares is that 95% generally is coming uh, from that single source of property tax dollars. And so there's a real um, push, I think, at the federal level to try to look at um, diversifying and creating a more modernized uh, revenue framework for municipalities. Um, and so that's why they've kind of provided that information as well as the draft re resolution. The resolution kind of, it speaks to um, 
you know, that the federal government continue to work uh, with municipalities to maintain the Canada Community Building Fund, which I know has been a, a topic of conversation more than once around this table. Um, it talks about uh, asking the federal government to consider in budget 2024 to include a new program for water and wastewater infrastructure and an increase to disaster mitigation and ad adaptation funds, certainly all of which we have discussed uh, such things at this table before. And then it does go on to discuss, you know, a resolution related to a municipal growth framework to modernize the way that municipalities are funded so we can support Canada's long-term growth. So I'm just at this point wondering if councillors have any questions on this. I, I would be able to answer some. Um, most questions I probably would not be able to answer and may need to kind of refer back to Fraser Patterson on this, but also looking to see if you would be in support of such a resolution at this time or if you'd like to learn more. So I'll open it for discussion from there. Yeah, for me, Madam Warren, I mean, when, when you look at this resolution and you look at the language of this report and, and this framework, I mean, when you're talking, you know, negotiation, you're talking long-term plan, you're talking framework, um, I, you mentioned the CCBF, the Canada Community Building Fund, you know that's dear to my heart, and, you know, that, 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 that to me is a long-term uh, goal and strategy uh, of where we're going to be when it comes to infrastructure in our, in our municipality and when it comes to helping uh, build uh, affordable housing and, and homes and, uh, you know, uh, wastewater and, and uh, sewer treatment and all that stuff. So I, I think this is, uh, this is great language and, and I look forward to, uh, to, to more information and, and yeah, I would support this resolution for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, one important piece of information I did forget to mention is I did ask Mr. Patterson, um, you know, if our federal MPs in this region had been, you know, contacted and consulted on this matter. And he did, indica he did indicate that both um, MP Batiste and MP Kellaway had participated in a Zoom call a little while back to discuss it. And um, I think those conversations are going to be ongoing, right? So um, I just wanted to make sure that we had touched base with our local representatives before putting anything forward. Um, and I guess also important information is, you know, as per Councillor Patterson, the uh, CCBF is being renegotiated. And uh, so if changes are coming down the pipe, uh, they, they'd like it on record at this time that, you know, that we are all advocating for continued use of it or continued availability of it. So maybe I'll just ask you, uh, Councillor Melanie Sampson, if you had any thoughts, if you wanted to support a resolution at this time or... Yeah, I would definitely be comfortable supporting this resolution. Again, again we're, we're looking for advocating for, for funds for projects that we know we are going to face in this county. You know, we do have a infrastructure deficit that we need to solve, we need to, we need to deal with in the coming years. And of course, any uh, funding that could be uh, find its way to us from the federal government mm -hmm. would be fantastic to really help make those projects a reality and also make things affordable to the residents. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brent Sampson, did you have any comments on that? No, I'm fine with this as well. Okay. It's, I think it aligns with everybody's priorities. Yeah. Okay, so if that's the case, could I have a motion to um, approve the resolution as presented and after which time, once the motion's approved, I will go through and read it? <laughs> it's a bit lengthy, I know. <laughs> it does need to be on the record, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> Deputy Warden. I'll make that motion, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councillor Sampson. I'll second that. See, I knew it was going to be a Councillor Sampson. I was a safe bet there. Any further discussion on the resolution? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. Uh, so uh, very briefly, I will read through the motion, or the resolution. It, it goes on to say, whereas Canada has experienced record population growth, having welcomed 1.25 million new Canadians last year alone, and whereas according to the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, we need to build at least 3.5 million additional homes by 2030, and municipalities need to build or expand the infrastructure to accommodate this growth. And whereas FCM has estimated that the cost of the municipal infrastructure required support housing development is on average in the range of $107,000 per unit. And whereas according to Statistics Canada, the cost of, to upgrade existing municipal infrastructure so that it was in a good state of repair is in the range of $170 billion. And whereas non-residential con construction price inflation has risen by 29% since the end of 2020 and municipalities are facing soaring costs for infrastructure projects without a corresponding growth in revenue. 
And whereas, unlike federal and provincial revenue, municipal tax revenue has not increased in recent years along with inflation, economic growth, or population growth. And whereas municipalities are facing a gap in federal infrastructure funding as the 10-year investing in Canada infrastructure program has come to an end, the Canada Community Building Fund is being renegotiated, and the Permanent Public Transit Fund is set to start in 2026. And whereas the Canada Community Building Fund, which was formerly known as the Federal Gas Tax Fund, provides more than $2.4 billion in annual capital funding directly to municipalities through a predict predictable allocation mechanism, and municipalities of all sizes use the CCBF to deliver direct results for Canadians by building and renewing critical core public infrastructure, including water infrastructure, local roads, public transit, and community and cultural and recreation facilities. Now therefore be it resolved that the federal government work with agreement signatories and municipalities to maintain the CCBF as a source of direct, predictable, long-term funding for local infrastructure priorities, and be it further resolved that the federal government commit in budget 2024 to the next generation of infrastructure programs, including a new program for water and wastewater infrastructure and an increase to the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund. And be it further resolved that the federal government convene provinces, territories, and municipalities to negotiate a municipal growth framework to modernize the way that municipalities are funded in order to enable Canada's long-term growth. Okay, <laughs> so that is the resolution. We'll forward a copy of that off to Mr. Patterson, Councillor Patterson in Victoria County, as well as to FCM. Maybe also uh, to our MP, uh, Mike Calloway, to make him aware that we have passed uh, the resolution at the council table. Is there anyone else that you think we need to kind of keep in the loop on that? Okay. All right, so we'll get that done and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. So thank you, folks. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, the new Provincial Department of Emergency Management. So I did provide some information. Um, it was contained in a letter from uh, Minister Lohr, I believe, um, where it outlined uh, several changes uh, to emergency response, including the establishment of a Nova Scotia Guard uh, program, which is, uh, again, brand new to the province. Um, discussing, discussing it with uh, CAO McCulloch, we just, you know, we talked about um, putting it on the agenda for this evening and potentially having our emergency management coordinator come back to council at a future meeting with a bit of impacts and implications for how it could potentially affect emergency management planning in Richmond County. But if there are any comments that councillors wanted to make or questions they might want Steve to kind of chase down, this would be a great time to share them or you can in the upcoming days as well. Um, so any, any comments or questions on that? Okay. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much Steve would be able to gather at the moment because it hasn't passed through the legislature. Yeah. It's just sort of an idea in the ether at this point. So it may be something we have to wait till at least next year. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's going to take a little bit of time. So, okay. Um, so the next item is a statement on f uh, former warden Madeline Libis. As many of you know, um, Madeline Libis passed away um, not long ago. I attended her funeral on uh, Friday and uh, just wanted to read a bit of a statement uh, to make it part of the record. Um, Ms. Libis, Mrs. Libis was our, uh, an elected councillor in Richmond County for 12 years. Um, of those 12, she was the warden from 19, 1988 to 97, so she held that position for nine years. Um, she was the first, I believe, uh, woman in Cape Breton to hold such a position um, on our island, so uh, pretty, pretty big deal and, and definitely a trailblazer. I know I still run in across her name on many important documents um, as I kind of, you know, look look through as we're researching things so uh, so her impact has been one that is very lasting her leadership wasn't limited to Richmond County of course uh, we know that during her time as an elected official she also served as uh, president of the Union of Nova Scotia municipalities for a year uh, I believe she was the first woman to do that, that that as well and she also served for five years on the Federation of Canadian municipalities board of directors which is 
pretty impressive for a politician from Little Richmond County um, to be showing such leadership at both a provincial and a federal level. Um, it, was a, it was a big deal then and it's a big deal now. Um, so obviously, too, uh, Madeline's commitment to her community was always front and center. She was a longtime volunteer for many community organizations, including the River Bourgeois Community Services Society and the Richmond Villa. She was also well known for her role with Island Alternative Measures, which is now branded as Island Community Justice Society. And I remember uh, talking with her about that back in around 2000, um, because it was, a, you know, it was still rolling out after it had been piloted. Um, and you know, she really felt strongly that it was going to help to turn around, um, you know, young people who found themselves in trouble with the law and getting it that uh, second chance where community would be able to intervene, uh, family would be able to intervene, and victims would be able to intervene as well to work together for better um, rehabilitation outcomes. And uh, certainly a program that I personally benefited from, and, uh, and I laud her, um, her commitment to that program and to island community justice in general. Um, our communities, our municipalities, and our province and our country really all benefited from Madeline's leadership and forthright nature. We did lower the flags at our office last week um, until after her funeral service on Friday. So just wanted to officially extend on behalf of Richmond County Council our condolences to her family and friends. And we hope that they find the comfort, comfort in the legacy of leadership, integrity, and kindness that she leaves behind. So I don't know if anybody had any questions or, or comments they wanted to make, but um, I d definitely wanted to put that on the record for such a long time um, person of, who gave great service to this county. So, Okay. Um, th so thanks very much, everyone, for... Um, uh, for indulging me with those comments and um, I will turn things over I think to the, our CAO next um, for a quick discussion on the administration operations report. Sure Madam Chair it, it is there uh, for your review and questions if anybody has it uh, as you can see it's another busy month uh, and uh, uh, but wheels are turning and uh, lots of projects on the go. Thank you, Troy. Um, I did uh, kind of wonder, and I know there have been some questions recently on the water, the study, the, the rate study. So I'm um, wondering, it is a complex study, wondering if we could do maybe a bit of a quick fact sheet, maybe a little bit of a one-pager just to help people interpret through the, the higher level components of it so that it's a little bit more digestible. And I know that uh, Councillor Melanie has done some of that, you know, work already to, to assist people in interpreting the, the document. Um, is that something we could maybe look to you to assist with? Sure. Um, I, I just ask uh, you send what you, you have and uh, we'll get a look at it and maybe we can do something with the timelines to help people understand yeah. what what we're looking at and maybe put something up on our social media that can be shared and yeah. try and help people uh, with the, the main, the meat and the gravy of that report because it will be a large report once it's done. Uh, those rate studies take a while and they're quite lengthy documents, but by all means if we can uh, get it crunched down to a single page, uh, by all means. <laughs> and uh, if you've already started that process, thank you. <laughs> and uh, But we'll, we'll see what you got and take it from there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think the next item is back over to you, the briefing note regarding the appointment of returning officer and review of election tariffs of fees and expenses. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Madam Warden. Uh, yeah, as uh, was directed by this council, uh, we put the call out. Uh, we were very lucky. We had uh, lots of interested people. Uh, in the end, uh, a familiar face uh, ended up getting the role again, uh, Mr. Claire Rankin. And... Uh, the tariffs and fees were discussed between uh, the RO, or sorry, the returning officer and uh, the clerk and myself uh, with the uh, um, market amounts uh, within Cape Breton for similar roles in the other counties. And, uh, you know, uh, there were adjustments made to keep us into the market and to get uh, some, some people, if we kept the dollars the same, would be less than minimum wage for poll clerks and stuff like that. So that stuff was all adjusted. But as everything else, it will result in a higher cost for the election, which we'll review again at budget time. Okay. Thank you, CAO. Are there any questions for Troy on that item? Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which are community acknowledgements. And we always kick this one off uh, with our volunteer of the month. So would like to extend a big congratulations and thank you to Jeanette Jeffrey. She's a volunteer whose dedication extends across numerous organizations, notably the Lewisdale CWL, Lions Club, the Fleur de Lis Seniors Club, and the Straight Richmond Palliative Care Society. As the coordinator for events such as Daisy Day and Sunflower Day, she exemplifies commitment, compassion for others, and leadership. In the past, she has also volunteered her time to provide night lunches to patients at the Straight Richmond Hospital. She remains a steadfast presence at the Lewisdale Parish Bingo on Monday nights, where her unwavering volunteer spirit shines. So please join us in recognizing Jeanette for her hard work, dedication, and commitment to her community. We thank her for all that she does for Richmond County. So thank you very much, Jeanette, if you're listening at home. And would anybody like to comment on that? I'm sure maybe Councillor Samson. <laughs> um, when I shared the post that we did uh, from the county here, I just, you know, said it very simply that there is rarely an event that takes place in the in Lewisdale that Jeanette is not present and volunteering, and just she's just such an asset to. Uh, to the community, and uh, I don't think a person would disagree that's been to any event. She's always right there to help lend a helping hand no matter what people ask of her. So very well-deserved recognition for her. Awesome. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. All right. Um, additional community acknowledgements. I have a few I'd like to share with you. Um, first would be the Community of Care Awards that were held last week. Uh, the ceremony was, the award ceremony was in, uh, at the Civic Center in Port Hawkesbury. Um, but we saw winners from all across the southern Cape Breton region. Uh, so I want to congratulate everyone, um, particularly uh, those Ocean View Wellness Center uh, for the Making Your Health Your Business Award. Stephen Anthony uh, was awarded the Making a Daily Difference Volunteer Award. Uh, we had several healthcare champions, Lynn Delory and Dr. Ackenborough, um, who were awarded as well. Uh, healthy Communities Leaders were identified as Dr. Stephen Droche and Rayanne Haley. We had, of course, healthcare champion as well, identified as Amanda Landry. Uh, Lifelong Learner Award was provided to Crystal Burns. We had a dedicated radiology pharmacy and other allied health award go to Gabrielle Richard, and a dedicated mental health long-term and continuing care award go to Carrie McKenzie. And last but not least, our Mentor Champion Award went to Phoebe Boudreaux. So lots of very familiar names and faces from all across Richmond County and Southern Cape Breton uh, Island, and we just want to say a huge thank you to them for the work that they do. I know they just represent the tip of the iceberg of a larger healthcare team behind them, but, um, but important to recognize the extra efforts that, that people put in. So does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Um, the next acknowledgement I wanted to mention are for the Richmond Cheer Athletics. So I don't know about you guys, but my Facebook was lit up this past weekend uh, with success from with the RCA teams. Richmond uh, Cheer Athletics sent two teams to the Canadian Cheerleading Champions in Halifax this past weekend. Both teams captured national titles. Saturday and Sunday of last weekend, the Scarlet team and the Crimson team competed in Cheer Expo, which attracted 150 teams from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, Newfoundland, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec, and Barbados. You know. <laughs> I don't know, that was pretty random, but uh, I mean, what an experience for the folks from Barbados who I understand experienced their first snow on Friday. So, um, so they got a double, uh, double benefit out of that. The Crimson team was awarded as national champions. The Scarlet team was awarded national champions, plus they received an award for awesome choreography, which resulted in a, in a super bid for them to be able to compete at an international competition of their choosing, meaning that the competition fees would be covered for the team. They were one of only two teams of the 150 there to receive that award. So just want to say a huge congratulations to the participating team members and to the coaches and volunteers and parents who support them. It's quite an accomplishment. Little old Richmond County taking home some national banners again. Um, they're an amazing group. So, um, Okay, so I'm going to give other people a turn. Does anybody have anything they would like to add to community acknowledgments? Okay. Well, then I'm just going to take another second and say a happy birthday to Tom Mumbercat, who turned 90. <laughs> and we had a lovely time at the Legion Saturday night celebrating that, and Councillor Brent Sampson was there as well. So <laughs> I have to mention it. <laughs> okay. 
So if there are no other community acknowledgements, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And it, would, it begins with correspondence. The first uh, correspondence where there's action required is from uh, Director of Public Works, Chris Boudreau. So thank you, Chris, for providing the briefing note regarding the 2024 heavy garbage collection. Um, the information in the briefing note outlines the uh, estimated cost of $160,000. Those funds would be allocated in the 2024-25 budget. So I'd be looking for a motion from uh, Council to proceed with the 2024 heavy collection at that cost uh, in this year, in this 24-25 budget. Questions? I'd be willing to make that motion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion on the uh, heavy collection for this year? I know people have been asking me about it already, so excited to see that on the go. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. The next item on the agenda is an, a briefing note uh, from Jim Davis regarding the guarantee for the village of St. Peter's. Um, so we'd be looking for a motion on this one to provide a guarantee for the village of St. Peter's for the purpose of borrowing to convert their balloon payment into a new five-year debenture in the amount of $497,300. So any questions from councillors or a motion to be made in that regard? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Is there any further discussion on that item? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. The next item on the agenda. Oh, do I need to read it? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, I'm just going to put these on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, whereas the village of St. Peter's is a village situated within the municipality of the County of Richmond, and whereas the village of St. Peter's has, with the approval of the electors of the village, determined to borrow the aggregate principal amount of $497,300 for the purposes of balloon payment from original loan, whereas the village of St. Peter's has requested that the municipality guarantee said borrowing, and whereas Section 89 of the Municipal Government Act provides that a, a municipality may guarantee a loan for a village, and whereas Section 88.3 of the Municipal Government Act provides that no guarantee of a borrowing by a municipality shall have effect unless the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has approved of the bor proposed borrowing or debenture and of the proposed guarantee. Be it therefore resolved that the municipality of the County of Richmond does hereby approve the borrowing by the Village of St. Peter's the aggregate principal amount of $497,300 for the purposes set out above, that subject to the approval of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the municipality does unconditionally guarantee repayment of the principal and interest of the borrowing so made, and that upon the issue of the debentures, the warden and the clerk of the municipality do sign the, uh, the guarantee attached to each of the debentures and affix there to the corporate seal of the municipality. Done. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder on that. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is uh, additional information, a memo from uh, Jim Davis, the interim CFO, regarding the grant request from the River Bourgeois Community Services for the Type 3 Recreation Sponsorship Grant Fund. I feel like I need to take a deep breath. Community Fest Dance. If, yes, for the Community Fest Dance. Um, so it's a specific activity within their um, larger, I guess, group of, uh, of festival activities. Um, would anybody be interested in making that motion, um, we would essentially need to uh, do so with the understanding that we would be reestablishing a grant structure again this year um, that would be able to at least cover the, the $500. Um, we, you know, I guess the other uh, important note is that uh, staff, if we do approve it this year or tonight, staff will pencil that in to our, you know, our grant contributions list. Um, so that we, we know it's captured there. So that's the conditions under which we would be able to approve it this evening if we kind of knew that we were going to go in that direction. So I'll open it for comments from councillors. It's a little bit of, uh, I know, rough timing because we don't have that list published yet. And don't, we don't know what the, the full amount will be. So, Councillor Melly, yeah. Um, so their event is August 31st, which is a fair bit of time away. Their request is also fairly small compared to the cost of the event. 
um, where we haven't even begun budget deliberations, I think, to even like say that we're going to establish. I mean, I think we probably are, but you can never presume. I just wonder if we could put it on hold until we at least start some budget discussions, and then it could be first on the list of ones that we review when the time comes. Yeah, I don't, I didn't get a sense from the application that there's an urgency of timing there. I mean, us neither. Okay. So we could certainly table that for now and um, maybe by next month or certainly by, you know, um, well, again, by next month for sure, we will we'll have a better we'll be sense of that way. direction. So yeah. are counselors okay with tabling that for now then? I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that and I don't, I don't think they would have an issue with it. So, okay. So we'll make it as a, a priority kind of one as the first one in the door for this fiscal for the next uh, discussion. I'll table it until um, May, I did think. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, we have another memo from uh, Jim Davis, our interim CFO, regarding a request from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society for the Type 4 Regional uh, health general grant fund in the amount of ten thousand. Um, that so noted on on the agenda. However, I do did notice from the application they're actually looking to access the CCBF funds that we set aside for waterfront, harborfront kind of development. I just want to acknowledge too that Sherry Sampson from the Mariner Society is uh, in the audience this evening, and I'm sure can fill in blanks if we have any extra questions. But. Um, so they've outlined, uh, I guess, a piece of work that needs to be done um, and certainly have outlined the, the key components of why they feel that it, it would qualify for the CCBF funds from a recreation, tourism uh, perspective, et cetera. So um, I would open this one, I guess, for discussion from Council if you'd be in favour of awarding the 10000 I think it represents about 50% of yeah, the costs. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we have the opposite issue here where there is a time issue on this one. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important uh, co comment, Councillor Brent Sampson. The, there's a construction period by which they need to get this piece of work done quickly. Um, and uh, and uh, it's quickly evaporating. <laughs> I mean, but in my mind, it's, a, it's different than the last request just because this one it comes out of a separate fund we already had funds set aside for that which we've been carrying forward year over year so i would be less inclined to say we need to wait until we get further into our deliberations we had originally set aside i think 50 and then we've we used some but we we certainly have money left in that yeah. predetermined pot for lack of a better word i believe so. there's about 35,000 yeah. left in that pot yeah okay yeah, that's that's exactly, and, and like Councillor Melanie said, uh, we had put that aside under the CCBF uh, underwater development, and it was fifty thousand, and uh, we did uh, we did fund a project for fifteen thousand, so there is a balance of thirty five thousand there. So, yeah, I'd be more than willing to uh, put that motion forward and uh, and approve that ten thousand from the uh, water water development uh, CCBF fund. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Warden. So the motion has been to uh, approve uh, the grant request from the River Bourgeois Mariner Society for $10,000 from the CCBF uh, Waterfront Development Funds. Um, could I have a seconder on that motion, please? I'll second that, but I think we probably need to amend the motion because in order to access the money through the CCBF, we have to have a prior approval that the project would qualify, right? So, uh, well, I, I don't know that it's a prior approval. I think you essentially staff will essentially get an opinion, yes. right? So we could, I guess, add on to the motion, you know, subject to assessment for, by staff as to the project's eligibility. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So the motion's been made and seconded. Could I have a, or is there any, is there any further discussion? I don't need a third. I was going around the room. <laughs> Everybody move. Everybody move. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If there's no further discussion, then uh, all for all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed. All right. That motion is carried. So thank you, uh, Sherry, and to the Mariners for providing that information. And please extend our thanks also, Troy, to uh, to Jim Davis for pre uh, preparing the information for council. We'll get him to run the pre-call on it as well. Yeah, that's great. 
Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is um, correspondence with action required uh, from CAO Troy McCulloch. So this was re relating to, um, uh, I guess, a, a, a glitch we had in our last uh, Committee of the Whole. We had a request from the Richmond County Literacy Network um, for uh, support to support the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, which I know is a program that we discussed here a number of times, wanting to see it back in the county, and councillors had been very much in favour of that. There was some, um, I think, miscommunication, though. It turned out that the request for funding was for the the, the gap amount of $2,600 um, that they need to get the program off the ground, but we approved an amount of $1,000 um, because it wasn't, maybe there wasn't quite as clearly stated as what we needed it to be. So, um, or misunderstanding of some kind anyways. So the suggestion has been um, uh, that we, uh, you know, look at, you know, I reevaluate our, our decision um, to potentially uh, support the project instead of at $1,000, but to cover the $2,600 shortfall um, and further that th those funds be taken from the previous fiscal year because that was the year in which it was requested. So I would open that for discussion um, from council, um, but it would, be to, uh, it would be to move forward as such. So councillors, do you have any comments on this one? Everybody's okay with that or not in favor or not in favor? I just would need a, a sense. Yeah, I, I, I see it now at the bottom, whereas um, I was misunderstanding that originally too, thinking that the one of the one of the $1,000 grants they had requested where they had been turned down at, at a separate location sort of thing, I thought they were looking for that, but the way it's written out on the bottom, they're covering that 1000 mm -hmm. and would like us to cover the remainder. So um, at this point, I'm like, I... I at expense the rest of the um, district fund at that time I still am fine with that yeah. and however the rest of the council wants to proceed with it I'm going to open up our grant list so you go ahead there deputy warden go ahead yeah when it comes to my district fund uh, in uh, last year's uh, fiscal uh, I I'm pretty sure I had $500 left in my district fund so uh, I'd be willing to put that $500 towards uh, this, this ask. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Go ahead. So I wasn't at the last committee the whole, so I wasn't part of the discussion, but I know I've got lots of money left in my district fund, so whatever we need to take. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson, and I, I have some funds as well. So what we could do is, um, so for the amount of the 2600 we could take uh, 1000 from district four we could take a thousand from district five you've offered uh sorry not district five district three you've offered uh deputy warden a 500 from district one and then we would just need an additional hundred dollars um actually I'll, I'll just put in the 1100 so 1100 from district three a thousand from district four and 500 from district one would get us to the 2600 is that okay with everyone Okay, so I need a motion um, to amend the previously adopted motion made on March 11th, 2024 for the Richmond County Literacy Network um, Regional Health General Grant Request uh, and to be adjusted to the amount, uh, to adjust the amount of the original ask to $2,600 and further move that the funds be allocated from the 2023-2024 budget as follows, $500 from District 1, 1100 District 3, and 1000 from District 4. So could I have a motion to that effect, please? I don't think we'd need to do that. We already had a thousand in before, anyway, right? Like I had the five hundred that was remaining. No, but I had the five hundred remaining in District Five. I'd rather leave that there if possible. Like put it towards this. Oh, okay. Yeah. It yeah. Where it was already oh. So really, we're only short sixteen. You can just pop it. Yeah, we're we're only short sixteen hundred. We're short the sixteen hundred. Yeah. So short the sixteen hundred, but if we're amending the motion, it would be for a twenty six hundred dollar motion. So I guess my thought was that the original thousand we'd leave the same and then add sixteen hundred to it from other pots. Right. I don't. Okay. I think that that just allow like then it's then it's obvious that District Five has supported the motion, right? Because this right. new this new allocation doesn't have any money from District Five. So I think what Councillor Sampson is saying is that he would like District Five to be part of the yeah. support of this. So what we could do is the, the amendment could be that the allocation would be um, 
the 500 from District 5, as, as originally stated, uh, the 600 from District, th uh, th uh, yeah, sorry, di 600 from District 3, and then 1,000 from District 4, and 500 from District 1 we could, to get to the 2,600. Okay? Clear as mud. Yep. All right. We got her. All right. So that's the amendment. Um, is there any further discussion on that? Or I guess I would need someone to actually make that motion. I don't. I'm willing to make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Brett Sampson. Any, any uh, seconder? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? And that motion is carried. Okay, um, so the next item on the agenda uh, is the message from uh, the correspondence from Kieran Walker, who is the administrator with the Gaelic Council of Nova Scotia, regarding the flag raising and proclamation request. Um, so I believe we held such an event last year, and it was awesome. So um, maybe we could go down that road again, but we would need a resolution from Council because it doesn't sit in our flag policy as a matter of record already, so. I'd be willing to make that motion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Um, so it is to move forward with the flag raising and proclamation ceremony, that it would be in May, and uh, also further uh, potentially to have, sc have staff advertise an invitation to members of the public and local media. Is that okay if we add that on to the motion? Yeah, okay. So the motion's been made by Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder, please? As a Scottish person, a partial Scottish person, I would be happy to second that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion is carried. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is correspondence from the Richmond Education Center and Academy. It's a request for monetary contributions for the Graduation Bursary Scholarship Fund. Um, so inquiring with staff, this is something that we receive generally every year, and we generally do defer to budget. It appears as a kind of one of those strategic investments that we make at budget time. So um, I guess, you know, and, and also similar to the grant request of 500 from the Community Services Society, maybe waiting a little bit till we know exactly where we're at, um, or not, a little bit closer to where we're at anyways would be helpful. Um, I will say though this one would be more time sensitive because it is for the June graduation, right? Okay. So we've got a little bit of time, but not a lot of time. Um, so I'd look for a motion from council to defer this request to budget discussions. It does say in here that they'd like to receive the information by early May. Mm -hmm. So that's silly. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe that budget discussions they will, will start this month. So, you know, and we generally do start with the grant requests first. So if we could at least get a sense of that, we might, we should still be able to meet that timeline, Councillor. Even if yeah. we contact them in early May. Yeah. That you're heading that way by that point. Yeah. Just so they know. Exactly. Okay. Great. So could I get a motion to that effect to defer to budget? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Any further discussion on this item? Um, should we decide on what they were asking about whether or not we choose or the school chooses if we are going forward? Did you want to make that? Yeah. It's not a financial implication, so we could probably discuss that and determine yeah, it now. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I think in the past, the school, we've left that to the school to choose. Uh, was ca are counselors okay with that again this year? I'd probably be much more comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I would be much more comfortable with that as well, yeah. Okay, so I think we have consensus on that. I'm not sure we need a motion to that effect. We can just ask staff when you do reach out yep. to indicate that they should choose who the recipient would be. Okay. Thank you. And the next item on the agenda then is an um, email from Cindy Walker from Pepperell Place Inn and Chocolate Tea. She's also our representative on the Des Destination Cape Breton Association Board uh, for Richmond County. And she is bringing to our attention a Tourism Nova Scotia Emerging Destinations Program um, and asking for the county support in applying for the program. 
I will just want to note to, to counselors, and I did discuss this with Troy earlier today, and at this stage, maybe the, you know, rather than committing to a full-on application from the county at this point, we do need to collect a little more information because it would take some running of such a program to occur, um, which would probably be outside the scope of what our staff could handle on, you know, internally. So um, perhaps the motion at this stage would be to uh, ask staff to connect with Ms. Walker to uh, explore the program to see if it would be possible for us to participate. So would staff be, or council be okay with that? Yeah, I'd be willing to make that motion. Thank you, Councillor Brent Sampson. Could I have a seconder? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay, um, there's, there's definitely a deadline on this one, so it'll, you know, hopefully that outreach could happen quickly, but I know there's a lot going on here as well. Um, the only other thing I would mention, I guess, is that it does sort of align with our strategic plan, you know, in creating a 12 month of the year tourism destination for Richmond County. So, um, so many thanks to Cindy for raising that and bringing it to our attention. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, that motion is carried. I don't I know. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a letter from Minister Lohr regarding uh, the uh, service exchange agreement and um, the current status of that agreement and having been signed. So does anybody have any questions or comments they wanted to make regarding this letter? Okay, and just for members of the public, uh, for your information, the service exchange agreement was signed March 28th, came into effect on April 1st, and it will result in some changes to investment from the province into the municipality. So uh, good news for Richmond County. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is the act uh, information and activity report from the Cape Breton Regional Enterprise Network, which I believe was prepared by Martin Thompson, um, who has changed positions a little, but at least but was in place um, during the period of the report. Are there any questions or comments on the report? And this report is available as part of the information package on our website uh, for this particular meeting. I would re recommend to members of the public to take a peek. There's lots going on and we're getting lots of benefit out of being part of that Cape Breton Regional Enterprise Network. So, so thank you to Martin and the whole uh, CBREN team for putting that together. The next item on the agenda is a um, message from Christina Lovett, Provincial Director of Planning regarding the Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw. Are there any questions or comments that folks wanted to make regarding this item? Okay. So hearing none, um, we'll move on to the review of checks issued for March 2024. Are there any questions on the review of checks at this time? Okay. Um, uh, just, uh, so yeah. yeah, no, just uh, a question from a resident earlier uh, this afternoon, just wondering if those checks issued are on the website. Yeah, and just for, uh, I don't think you had a mic on there, Shelly, so, so for members of the public, yeah, I just want to make sure folks at home can hear. They, uh, so the, the, the checks are in online now in the information package for, this, for tonight's meeting. Once they're reviewed here, then they get put in the separate section on the website that are specifically for checks. And that's, I think, as per our communications policy. It is. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> it's working. <laughs> so thank you. Um, any other questions on the review of checks? Okay, so next item on the agenda is the review of action items. Uh, this is for information only, unless folks have any questions about any of the actions on there. Okay, hearing none, um, we're going to move on to items added to the agenda. So the only item added was the Earth Day Municipal Supports, and really this came as a result of an inquiry that I received from um, Stacy McRae, who, uh, who, who is interested in doing a bit of a spring 
a cleanup on, I think she's looking at the date of April 20th, the Saturday before Earth Day, I think is what is being planned at this point. And I just wanted to kind of put this on the agenda because she's extended the invitation to Council to participate in community cleanups. Um, she's going to be coordinating with RCMP um, as well as others to, to put this together in a safe way um, and connecting with groups that are already, that already have this on their agenda as well. So she's extended the invitation for us to participate. We can get in touch with her should we choose to do so and that goes to council and staff uh, whoever would like to chip in is more than welcome I did want to mention though for groups who are planning this and for uh, Ms. McRae's information that the county does have some supports that we can offer we do provide bags um, for uh, spring cleanups and um, if you communicate with our staff here at the municipal office they can coordinate the collection of those bags as well um, so that you're not needing to bring them anywhere um, yourself so so those those two pieces we can definitely help with any questions or comments from uh, on Earth Day and municipal support for that okay hearing none we'll move into the 15 minute question period so this question period is not restricted to items on the agenda we'll max it out at uh, 15 minutes if you're watching at home and you'd like to call in with a question the phone number is 902-226-9885 that's 902-226-9885 and we'll just give that a minute uh, because there's a little bit of a time lag between our discussions here and what you're seeing at home and certainly if there are any members of the gallery who would like to ask questions uh, you're more than welcome we'll just get you to state your name and what your question is so We'll just give that a few minutes. Excellent. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. We have a question. We get very excited with questions, so we're glad to see you. So come on down. We'll just get you to press your red button, and over to you. We get to get, get you to state your name, though, first. Huh. Sherry Barkadax. Okay, for the River Bush Mariners application, how does the timeline work with the provincial agency? Like, is that checked out before your regular meeting in a couple of weeks, or how does that work? The short answer is yes, that, that'll get checked out really quickly because we need to know before the regular meeting whether or not it'll qualify in order for us to effectively make the motion you know stick so yeah yeah <laughs> sometimes we have the answers you want to hear right <laughs> okay so I'm not hearing the phone ring and or seeing any further questions from the gallery um, so there being no further business we're going to adjourn the meeting at 8 31 I want to thank you all for being here and uh, thanks to the folks watching at home as well all right